Okay, so I know you all have one question on your mind right now. How did I get this black eye? Um, so I was at a bar the other night with a buddy of mine. We had a few drinks and we were talking about work. And we started talking about alt text. And things got really heated because when you talk about accessibility, things get heated and maybe a few punches were exchanged because I think you should put alt text on all images. And he said, no, don't put alt text on all images. Yeah, so it was a fight. So if I get anything wrong in here, uh, see me out back and we'll discuss it. <laughs> okay, so uh, my name's Kevin Lamping. Um, I, I um, go by K Lamping on Twitter. Um, I'm a front-end web developer. I'm a native Texan as well. I think that's more important. As my slides disappear on me, that's always good. There we go. Um, I was born in Bernie, Texas. Anybody know where Bernie, Texas is? Yeah, beautiful location. Uh, I've spent my entire life in Texas. I spent a few years, I, I went to school up in Dallas, and then I moved to Austin, spent a few years in Austin as a developer, and then I spent a few years, uh, not a few years, I spent about six months as a high school teacher teaching web development, and that was a really interesting time in my life. Uh, I'm currently living in San Antonio with my wife, and this is my son. He's gonna be three in March, and you'll see him later in, uh, in the talk. Um, six years ago, when I, my first, job in, uh, my first job out of college, I started getting involved in, in web, or, sorry, in accessibility. I uh, was working with two other web developers, really great web developers. We were tasked with making an eye care website accessible. You can imagine why an eye care website would need to be accessible. And this really introduced me to accessibility from a best practice standpoint. And ever since then, I've always been interested in accessibility. How can we make sites accessible? Um, before I get into that, I need to ask all of y'all a favor. Um, there's only a few of y'all out there who have laptops open, but if you do have a laptop open or a tablet open or a phone open, if you can bring up your, uh, a site that you are currently working on or you've just worked on or your favorite site that you've worked on or your least favorite site that you worked on, just something to get in your mind. And then for those of you who don't have something open, if you could just think of a site that you've worked on, it can be recent, old, it can be good or bad. Um, we're gonna be using this website and kind of thinking about it um, using it as, as an example for um, what we can do to improve uh, accessibility. So these are the WCAG 2.0 or WCAG or WCAG 2.0, whatever you want to call them, guidelines. Um, they're hard to see, but I assume all of y'all have all these memorized, right? Maybe, maybe not, no, okay. Well, it doesn't matter. Uh, thinking of that site or you're looking at that site that I talked about, um, go ahead and raise your hands if you know that that site meets all of these guidelines. Yeah, I don't think I have a site that meets all those guidelines either. Um, how about 90%? 75%? Okay, good. Um, if you could do me a favor, if you have any feedback, I'd appreciate to hear it. Um, you know, 75% is pretty good, so if, if there's something um, that you think uh, I, I should know, I'd, I'd really appreciate to have any feedback, because I'm always learning. We'll get to those again later. Um, your job today is I'm gonna present some techniques to you to improve HTML5 accessibility. That site that I mentioned, I want you to think of, okay, how can I apply this to that site? Now, that site, I'm gonna mention that site again. Um, how many of y'all were paid to make sure that that site was accessible? Raise your hands if that was one of your deliverables. This website will be accessible. Okay, uh, less than half of you, uh, two or three. Um, what that means to me is that web accessibility is something that we developers have to care about. We're the ones who have to put the effort in. We're the ones who have to ensure that our sites are accessible. Nobody's gonna be cracking a whip on us saying, hey, make sure this is accessible. So um, that's what that means to me. Now I've got good news and I've got bad news. Let's go ahead and start with the good news. Good news. Accessibility is easy. Um, for the most part, HTML is accessible. If you're building a simple site, it's pretty easy to make it accessible because HTML is accessible to begin with. You get your alt text in here, in there on, on your images. Um, you get your labels on your forms. You use proper semantics like headings, that sort of thing. 
And chances are, if you've got a, if you've got a basic site, it's going to be accessible. So I'm going to skip that stuff because that stuff's been covered before. There's plenty of good resources out there. I want to talk about HTML5 accessibility today. And the good news is that for the most part, what I'm presenting today is pretty easy to implement. On to the bad news. Accessibility is hard. Um, when you get past the simple stuff, when you start getting into JavaScript and you get into dynamic pages, it gets really hairy. And not even really t tricky stuff, even trivial, or uh, sorry, even simple non-trivial stuff, like having a dropdown or a pop-up window or even a modal. Having to manage focus, make sure that it's keyboard accessible, make sure that when it pops up, a screen reader read it, reads it. That can get pretty tricky. Trying to meet all of these guidelines, it's tough. Accessibility is a hard thing to do. And so as a web developer, you not only have to support all the browsers out there and make sure they're all compatible and all the different devices, you also have to include screen reader support. And you also have to include uh, assistive technology support, other, um, other than screen readers. You know, you have screen magnifiers, you have different input devices. It's really complex. And so the truth is, accessibility is frustrating, it's difficult, and it takes time. Don't let anybody ever tell you that accessibility is the simplest thing in the world, because unless you're building a one-page site that says, my name is so-and-so, it's going to be tricky. You're going to have to work on it. You're going to have to test it. Because of this, we have difficulty with it. We forget to follow the guidelines. You know, I, there's times when I build a site and I go, oh my gosh, I never checked whether it's accessible or not. And then we also let ourselves off the hook. We say, we're going to check, we'll, we'll check it later, we'll, we'll test it later, we'll add in accessibility later. Um, I know the basics of accessibility, so I don't need to test for it. We do all that sort of stuff. Um, so I want to begin, before we get started, I want to clear our conscious, conscien conscience, oof. And um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up my Catholic heritage, and we're going to have a quick little confessional so that we start with a clean slate. So if you could repeat after me out loud or in your head, I don't care, whichever one. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It has been so many days since I've last used a screen reader. I am, I am sorry for this and the sins of my past life, especially for that one website that I should have checked accessibility on and I just didn't do it. Amen. Okay, we're all forgiven, we're all clean. Forget about all your sins of your past. Let's look at accessibility. Now, I mentioned accessibility is hard and it's difficult for anything non-trivial. So why do we do it? I like to think about, think about web accessibility like this. When we're developing, we have a choice whether to make our application accessible or not. The user with a disability, they don't have that choice. They don't have the choice of saying, I'm going to turn off my disability so that I can access this website. I'm going to turn off my disability so that I can get past this capture form, and then once I'm past it, I'm, I'll, I can turn it back on. So basically, uh, we are the gatekeepers. We are the ones who decide whether users have access to our site or not. Just a side note, I was presenting this to my wife, you know, as a, a kind of go, going through it, and she's great for listening for me, to me for 40 minutes about something that she really doesn't know much about and probably isn't ever going to have to use. And she was like, what, what is that? Who is that? And I was like, that's Ghostbusters. She's, she's, I've never seen Ghostbusters. At that point, I knew that I failed as a husband to my wife. <laughs> so, Well, the good news is that accessibility is good for you. Um, accessibility, when you improve the accessibility of your website, you're going to improve the usability of your website. What I mean by that is... Um, this is a photo that my son took. You saw my son, he's about two and a half years old when he took that photo. Two and a half years old, he knows how to use a camera phone. That's, that's usability. Um, he knows how to use YouTube. He, or he knows how to use my phone to get to YouTube to watch the video that he wants. Anybody ever work out there, any uh, parents out there of toddlers, ever working on your screen and they go up to it and they try and scroll up and down and they get frustrated when they can't scroll. Yeah, it happens. Um, how about when you see somebody, a, a little kid with a magazine, try and use it like an iPad? 
It's pretty cute to watch. So I mention all of this because after Steve Jobs passed away, uh, Stevie Wonder had some unusual praise for him that you don't normally, that he didn't always get praised for. He got praised a lot for the accessibility side, or sorry, the usability side of the iPad and the iPhone, but uh, not so much the accessibility side. And I've got to find the actual quotes here that I'm gonna go through. Sorry, you think you prepare, but you don't. Okay, so this is from that interview, um, quotes that Stevie Wonder had to say. The one thing people aren't talking about is how he has made his technology accessible to the blind and the deaf and people who are quadriplegics and paraplegics. He has affected not just my world, but the worlds of millions of people who without that technology would not be able to discover the world. Anybody here think that uh, uh, iPhone or iPad could be accessible to somebody who can't see the screen? That kind of surprised me when I first learned that it could be, and I was like, how? They, they wouldn't know where to press. How are they gonna figure that out? Well, they took the time to think of a completely different uh, interaction method, and so instead of using, instead of precise cl uh, touches on the screen, they used gestures. And so um, that's opening that up. And be, um, well, I'll talk about, um, give another quote. He developed GarageBand, so now a 15-year-old kid can be in his bedroom with his iPad playing around and come up with unbelievable ideas, which can be taken to the next level. He has leveled the playing field. So I mentioned my son again. I'll bring him up even more. Um, when we first got the iPad, he was around one. I, I went ahead and gave it to him, and I turned on GarageBand, and he started playing with it, and he started making music. And that was amazing for me, because the simple act of removing the mouse from that um, interaction opened up this technology to him. It gave him the ability to create. And so, even though that's not necessarily a accessibility thing for the iPad, it opened up the world to somebody who couldn't use a mouse. My son at one years old, he couldn't use a mouse, but he could press the screen. And so that's how I kind of think of accessibility and usability combined. Uh, quote, another one from the, from the article. Um, I thought I printed this one out and I didn't, so that's bad. But, okay. uh, his company made it accessible without screaming, this is for the blind, this is for the deaf. It was just part of the OS. It was just part of the product. So that's what we have to think about, is we just make it part of the experience. He left us with a final, uh, Stephen Wonder left us with a challenge. I'm just hoping that his life will encourage and challenge those who are living still to do what he has done. You just make it one of your applications. It's in your technology. That will then create a world that will be accessible to anyone with a physical disability. So it turns out that when you make your site accessible, Stevie Wonder might just call you up and say thanks. So you've got that going for you. But um, Steve Jobs, you know, I mentioned that he, he did it, and, and Stevie Wonder mentions that he did it for the love of the, love of the technology. Um, Steve, uh, Steve Jobs, he didn't do it to meet government regulations. He didn't do it to meet guidelines. He did it because he wanted to make this technology accessible to anyone, regardless of the disability. And so that's what makes accessibility worth it to me. That's what makes fighting accessibility worth it to me. Okay. All that said, let's get to it. What does HTML5 mean for web accessibility? We'll start off by looking at the, section, uh, the new sectioning elements. How many of y'all have used the new, sectioning, the new section elements? Great, okay. Um, so let's look at some browser support from an accessibility side. We'll start off with header. Um, on header, in IE, Safari, and Opera, header gets reported as a div. Now this doesn't mean that it's not supported in the browser from an HTML5 perspective. It means that the browser doesn't expose that, that element as a header to anything besides the browser. And I'll get to what that means in a, in a minute. Um, Chrome reports it as a section, so it's a little bit better than, uh, than a div but uh, Firefox is the one that gets it right. It reports it as an actual header. Um, I need to mention at this point, this is only for Windows. On Mac, it's different. On Mac, Opera, uh, 
Chrome in Firefox, mispronounce it as a div, and then Safari is the one that gets it right. This support information comes from html5accessibility.com. They've got support for all the different HTML5 elements out there. Um, it comes from September of 2012. The web is moving fast, so some of this may have changed. It's always best to test your stuff to make sure that uh, it's got the latest. So that's header. Let's look at footer. Picture is pretty much the same, i.e., Safari, Opera on Windows don't support it. Chrome and Firefox do. And then on Mac, Opera and Chrome don't support it. And then Safari and Firefox do. Now, two elements down, not that great a support, maybe 50% at best. Um, the problem is it's bleaker than this. When we talk about uh, support, it's, it's a broader term. The browser is not the only one who's responsible for having support. The assistive technology must also work, must also be upgraded to make sure that it understands what the browser is telling it. So what I mean by that, I have to get into the relationship between the browser, the OS, and, and the assistive technology. When you load a website in a browser, that browser will expose, its, um, expose the structure to what's called an accessibility API. The accessibility API is part of the operating system. Um, it's kind of a middleman between the software being run and the assistive technology that's um, trying to access that software. So here, Safari will talk about the web page to the accessibility API, and then VoiceOver will listen, for, listen to the accessibility API for that kind of information. This might be a simplification of what's going on, but um, I just wanted to get it in, in an easy to understand format. What this means is that support needs to happen in two places. Not only does the browser need to support and talk and, and speak the right language, the HTML5 language to the uh, accessibility API, the assistive technology, VoiceOver in this instance, needs to listen for that and needs to understand what the browser is saying. So if you have a browser that exposes accessibility and exposes these elements, uh, ex exposes accessibility is not the proper term, sorry, exposes these elements, but the assistive technology, like a screen reader, it doesn't listen, then there's essentially no support. And then it works the other way. If the uh, screen reader is listening, but the browser never says it, then it's equally as useless. To make matters worse, we all know as web developers that users don't upgrade. How many of y'all are still supporting IE6 or IE7? Yeah, because users don't upgrade. And that's a problem because support may increase in the newer, uh, in the newer browsers and the newer technology, but we're gonna have to have backwards compatibility. So while we may have HTML5 accessibility support in 2013, 2014, we're still gonna have to, have to be coding for 2010. Brings me to my question, is there any hope for us to make HTML5 accessible? Because it, it's useless until browsers, assistive technology, and users upgrade their stuff. Well, when you're wearing a belt and the belt doesn't work, it's time to put on sus some suspenders. And I'll talk about what those suspenders are. We get back to our sectioning elements. Um, while browser support is low, it is still, um, it's still maturing on the HTML5 side, there's a backup. And that backup is called ARIA. Raise your hands for those of you who know what ARIA is. Cool. And I'm not talking about the opera singing? No? OK, good. Um, ARIA, it stands for Accessible Rich Internet Applications. And the good news is that it's got pretty good support out there. There's a lot. Uh, ARIA has actually been around since before HTML5. And so browsers and assistive technology has had time to um, to upgrade their stuff, and users have had time to upgrade their stuff. So ARIA works by adding semantics to your HTML. Um, what I mean by that is if you create a tab view on your page, you're gonna do it with a div around, your, around the whole thing, UL for your tabs, and then divs for your content. Well, with ARIA, we can add these role attributes, and we can add other ARIA-specific attributes to our elements to add semantics for, um, for browsers and assistive technology that's listening for those semantics. So we've got HTML, 
um, five support in some browsers, but we've got ARIA support in a lot of browsers. Well, the good news is that we can use both. We can combine them. And by combining them, we can inc um, drastically improve HTML5 accessibility support. Yes? Yeah, so the question is, is the role attribute part of the W3 spec? Um, I believe with HTML5 it is. So uh, I think if you're using an older validator that it will throw a warning, um, but I'm pretty sure with the latest HTML5 validation it doesn't throw a warning. Um, throw a shoe, with me, shoe at me if I'm wrong, but uh, yeah, yeah. But if it fails validation, it fails validation. I'd much rather have accessibility support. Okay, so let's look at this header tag. How do we improve accessibility support for header? Well, it's pretty easy. We're gonna add an, a role attribute. So header role equals banner. We get to use the same HTML5, which is really great. We have uh, a back, uh, sorry, a backwards compatible attribute so that assistive, te assistive technology that doesn't understand HTML5 can still understand what you mean. So it's basically a win-win situation. Footer, footer role equals content info. The names don't always match up. Header, banner, content info, footer, they don't match up, that's unfortunate, but it is what it is. Um, I'm gonna go through these pretty quickly because you can find all this stuff online, searching ARIA roles, you can get a full list of it. And there are some good diagrams out there as well. Nav. Nav role equals navigation. Almost one to one there. Aside role equals complementary. Um, article role, article. Did my, my, my just blue? Okay, I'm gonna have to uh, talk louder. Pretty sure it's that better. Yeah, so uh, I would say that these were out there before HTML5 came out, and then HTML5 came out and wanted to. Yeah, yeah. And so with Barcode, uh, I graded out here because I didn't, I didn't have support information. You can find support information for how well these roles are supported. Um, some of them are newer than others. Uh, with article, I couldn't find anything. Go ahead and use it. Nothing, nothing's going to hurt if you do use it. Section, section does have a role of abstract, but abstract is, sorry, section has a role called section, or a complementary role called section, but it's an abstract role. There's another, uh, an abstract role, and because it's an abstract role, that's kind of, a programming thing, uh, and so the W3C doesn't recommend that you use the section role, just, that's just the way it is. As an alternative, you can use a role called region. Region isn't as simple as having a section role would be. It's a little complicated, I'm not gonna get into the details, but I want you to know that it's there. Here's an instance where ARIA kind of helped shape HTML5. In the original HTML5 spec, they didn't have a main element. ARIA did. And because of the efforts of the accessibility community, they were able to push and push and say, we need a main element. Um, and so here we have an instance, main just got added to the HTML5 spec. And we have an instance where ARIA shaped the HTML5. Um, here's a little bit of repetition here, and that's just the way it's going to be. That's the price you pay for backwards accessibility, or backwards compatibility but it's accessible and that's what matters. Okay, so I talked about that website that y'all had in your mind. Any of y'all thinking right now that you could use a quick update to your website? They can add a couple ARIA attributes and improve. Um, I'm gonna tell you, this is a great quick win to improve the scannability of your website. Screen readers support ARIA, and what they can do is get a quick outline of your page. They don't wanna, they don't wanna get to the navigation, they just wanna get to the content, they can skip to it. They're done with the content, they want to get back to the navigation, they can easily skip to it because you have those uh, semantics in there. Okay, so those are the section roles. Let's talk audio and video. Anybody using audio and video out there? Yeah, a little bit, uh, two, three people. 
Um, I haven't had a chance to use audio or video yet. I do want to use audio because of the way that you can stop and play and skip to certain sections. I'm hoping to get a chance soon. So um, let's look at what uh, what we can do from an accessibility standpoint here. Now I've spent a lot of time talking about screen readers, but just because your site is accessible to screen readers and that it's usable in a screen reader, it doesn't mean that it's fully accessible to all the different disabilities out there. So you need to consider others in all your accessibility testing. People with limited mobility or people who are hearing impaired. Um, Parkinson's disease is one of the most common neuro uh, nervous system disorders for the elderly. Uh, it causes shaky hands, shaky arms, and that makes it difficult to use a, use a mouse. Just as my one-year-old son has trouble using a mouse, somebody with Parkinson's would have trouble using a mouse. And it's easier for them to use a keyboard. Anybody entering a form want to tab through it and get frustrated when they get to the last form field, they press tab, and they don't know where that focus went? Yeah, I, I get that and I'm like, am I, on, am I on the submit button? Am I not on the, am I on the cancel button? Um, so I actually think that here's another case where you improve the accessibility by making sure that your keyboard is accessible and you improve the usability as well. So HTML5 really helps with this, really helps improve keyboard support and um, support for those who are hearing impaired or don't have a pair of headphones and don't want to play music across the entire auditorium or where they work. Um, so they're trying to watch a video, but they don't want to. They don't want to have the sound on. Um, anyway, because HTML5 helps because it provides a standard to follow for the browsers. Uh, so the browsers can implement one single consistent um, control mechanism that has built-in keyboard functionality, and so it doesn't. Each developer doesn't have to re reinvent the wheel. The browser does it once. The user understands what those controls are and understands how to operate them. It's just that standard that helps uh, improve accessibility across the board. And uh, native keyboard support is for these controls is added in a lot of browsers already. So by using audio and video for browsers that support it, you've already got accessibility built in. That's one of the one of the great ways that uh, HTML5 helps accessibility. If you want to roll your own controls, you can make them accessible. Use the button. I, I highly recommend using the button to, uh, to build your controls because if you use a div, then you can't tap to that div. There's tricky hacks that you can use to get to it, but use a button, it's a simple thing to do. And then you have custom controls for your audio or your video, um, but it's still accessible. I mentioned hearing, hearing impaired users or uh, folks without headphones in a busy place, um, there's a track attribute for audio and video. And so with track, you simply um, point to the caption track that you have, and that's a VTT format, it's called WebVTT. Almost all the modern browsers support WebVT now. WebVTT now. And it provides us a common captioning track format so that we know how to write our, our tracks and they use and they're um, available across all the browsers. So to add that track, you do you add your track tag with the proper attributes, and um, you add it inside your video tag. And you can do this with uh, multiple tracks for multiple um, languages. It's really great. So um, that's that. I do want to make a point that support is out there, but users are slow to upgrade. And so um, you need to provide backup. And Flash can be that backup as long as you code it in an accessible way. Yes, Flash can be accessible. You've got to try out, you've got to try for it. You've really got to put in the, the effort to make Flash accessible. But and there's things to watch out for, things to be careful with it if you do go that route. Um, but it is an alternative. There's, uh, you can use a library that's already built that's got that, that backwards compatibility built in. And that way, you can more easily get your stuff out there without having to do too much work. This is a video.js. Um, if you do use a library, make sure you test. Not, you can't be guaranteed on anything without testing. Okay, moving on. We've got about 10 minutes left. Um, let's talk about figure and fig caption. These are two new elements that tie uh, captions with images. So we've always been able to do this. We just haven't been able to do it semantically. 
Uh, screen readers, when, when they're going through the page, when the user is using a screen reader and going through the page, they kind of have to guess that this image goes with this caption. Um, and pretty good, pretty easy to do that, but if you try and get tricky with it and want your, your image to be in some other element and that, it's harder to do. So we've got figure and fig caption, add semantics. It doesn't replace the image tag, it just adds structure to it. It creates this, this, um, this relationship between the image and the fig capture, kind of combines it together. And you can even use multiple images, or you can use a code tag, or you can use any other thing that you want to say, this is my example, this is my um, feature, and then this is my description about it. Now there's limited support out there for figure and fig caption, especially from the accessibility side. It's pretty much the same as you saw for header and footer, um, less than 50%. So what we're gonna do to fix that is use ARIA. ARIA has a role of group, ARIA defined. It's not exactly the same thing as figure, but we can use it for the same end. So we add a role of group to our figure element, and then we add ARIA labeled by C, so C is the ID of the caption that we want. And those two things tie those elements together semantically. Again, HTML5 is our belt, our pretty belt, and then ARIA is kind of our ugly suspenders, but they hold us up. They keep things accessible. That being said, you do want to have a fallback. Um, that fallback is for people for people who they don't have support for HTML5, they don't have support for ARIA. So this is one example of a way to do it. It's probably not a perfect example across the board, but it is one. So you add an alt, a photo one, and then in your caption you mention photo one. So you create that textual tie there. It's not a strong tie, but it gives users a hint of, of what's going on. I mentioned this isn't ideal. I also mentioned that accessibility is hard, and it's hard to get right. You know, we've had to cover a lot of bases here. Three, diff or three different ways to code pretty much the same thing. Um, accessibility is hard. That's the truth. So you work at it, and you do the best you can. Talk about Canvas real quick. It wouldn't be an HTML5 talk without talking about Canvas. Um, Canvas, it's got limited accessibility, so I personally wouldn't recommend it for any critical uh, flows you have. But we do, if we do need to use it, we can provide faults. Here's our Canvas tag. How many of y'all knew that we could add sub-DOM elements to our Canvas tag, just like we could with the div tag? I didn't know this before, but uh, you can do, you can create a structure that matches what you're defining in Canvas inside, and that structure in some browsers gets exposed to, the, to a screen reader. So that a screen reader, instead of having to figure out what's going on in Canvas, can just read the plain HTML that it's familiar with. Now, this isn't visible, but um, it is spoken, it's support is there for screen readers, and it's also keyword accessible. So to provide an example of this, of what keyword accessibility looks like, I'm going to open up this page. You all want to open this up? Give me a second. Enter. 
um, it would take me to Wikipedia, which is the link. So it would follow that link. So that's a way that you can provide uh, backwards compatibility for Canvas text. Pretty cool stuff. Support, I mentioned support is hit and miss there. IE 10, Chrome, and Firefox support that ability on um, Mac. It's Chrome, and it uh, turns out that the support was updated because it's also Firefox, because I just use Firefox for it. So hey, support is updated. So, uh, now, in some of these browsers, support isn't there for exposing that DOM to the accessibility API. Um, and in some browsers, it is. So just be aware of that and always test your stuff. One more thing to mention about Canvas is when a, when a user is using a screen magnifier, they can have trouble with 3D Canvas elements. So you want to provide a 2D fallback because what happens is they, from what I gather is they, you try to zoom in on the Canvas, it doesn't know exactly where you're trying to zoom in on the 3D plane and it just has trouble with that. So you want to make sure that you have a fallback for that as well. Um, again, you can fall back to Flash for browsers that don't support Canvas. Um, it's not fun, but it's a necessary step that you want to take to make sure that your website is accessible to all. Mention um, two things real quick about mobile accessibility. It doesn't really have to do with HTML5, but it's mobile. So the first thing is that you've got to test for it. Just because you're working on mobile doesn't mean you don't need to do accessibility testing. The truth, um, iOS is actually a very cheap assistive technology, well, relatively cheap. Um, there's lots of people who, with disabilities, they use mobile because it's a simpler experience. Mobile websites are, by their nature, for the most part, simpler than desktop websites. They're easier to access. And so you need to test your website if it's uh, if it's a mobile website, if it's a mobile website inside a web view, inside a native app, you got to test for it. Don't make excuses for yourself. The other thing is that you should use HTML5 elements. They've got native support. iOS is really good about this. Using something like a date picker versus rolling your own, it makes it more accessible. The browser already has support for it, and um, it's much easier for someone to figure out once how to use that native browser control then have to figure out your custom implementation. That being said, make sure you provide products. Test your stuff. Um, you know, if there's one thing I've iterated over and over again, test your stuff, put the effort into it. You would never release an HTML5 app into the wild without testing it across all the browsers. You wouldn't do the same for accessibility testing. Um, any, any Mac computer out there, you've already got a screen reader. It's called VoiceOver. Um, it's in your preferences. You can try it out. You don't have to pay any money. You've got a screen reader ready to go. Windows, you don't have to pay any money. You've got NVDA available. That being said, not all the screen readers are the same. You've got to test across the whole thing, the whole, the whole uh, range of assistive technology. Just because it works in Firefox, it could break an IE. Uh, the same goes if you work in NVDA and break your jobs. If your company has the budget, push for assistive technology, push for access to assistive technology. Jobs can be pretty pricey, but if you can afford a $600 phone, if your company can afford a $600 phone for testing, your company can afford the latest screen reader for testing as well. I had three questions that I posed in my description. I want to cover those. Um, does HTML5 improve accessibility or make it worse? Well, I've kind of shown that it's both. Canvas, can, the things like Canvas tag, it complicates things. Um, it introduces new paradigms that browsers have to deal with, that assistive technology has to deal with. But on the other side of things, you've got in, uh, input, new input types, new tags that improve the semantics. I'm personally on the optimistic side and say, yes, HTML5 does improve accessibility because we're adding this new layer, layer of semantics we are evolving the language to make it better. How have screen readers, how have screen readers adapted? They have gotten better. They are paying attention. Maybe it's not as fast as we want it to be, but um, they are adding support in there. And then hopefully you know the answer to this, this question that you've got to test your stuff. Just because you're using HTML5, just because it has these semantics in there, you still have to test your stuff for accessibility. The last quote I've got today is from Isaac Asimov, 
and that is, it is change, continuing change, inevitable change that is a dominant factor in society today. No sensible decision can be made any longer without taking into account not only the world as it is, but the world as it will be. You've got to test your stuff. Okay, there's two books I recommend for HTML5 accessibility. This covers everything from just basic accessibility. It talks about the accessibility API out there, and then it talks about using HTML5 and accessibility, using ARIA fallbacks, all that stuff. It talks about fit caption, it talks about audio, video, all that stuff. And then you've got web accessibility, which is a little bit older, but it's a real good, uh, covers all your bases on accessibility, talks about implementing it in an enterprise, um, all that good stuff. A couple credits, and then this is the repository. My slides are on there. Um, a somewhat transcript that I kind of planned off of is on there if you want to read through there. Um, I've also got a lot of resources. Um, every resource, pretty much every resource that I used for this talk about compatibility and articles that I read that, I, that were really interesting were on there. So if you go here, um, and that's two, uh, that's two ones, A11Y. Uh, if you go there, go to the resources.md. It's got a bunch of links on there. Um, and then if you have any questions or comments on this talk, I'd appreciate anything at Kate and Anthony. Any questions now? Thanks. Great, I appreciate you all sticking around. Um, enjoy the last talk, which is about to get started in, I think, 15 minutes, or 10 minutes.